What we're covering today is we're going to wrap up the monitoring and we're going to sort of ease into decision making, which is going to be kind of a, a review of uh, economic pest control like we covered in economic entomology. So let's just get going on that. The quiz this week was covering uh, mostly sampling techniques. I didn't really want to spend any time in lecture going over sampling techniques, given that we covered some of those in economic entomology, and for other areas, you've taken pathology courses or weeds courses, so you're familiar with how to sample. So this was over the sampling techniques. So uh, this first question, pests of the greenhouse are most often monitored using which sampling technique? Sticky cards. Yeah, sticky cards, right? So that was uh, pretty well received. Um, that actually should be a 98% on the uh, sticky cards. 2% were on pheromone lures. So yeah, generally when you're dealing with um, small things that you commonly find in greenhouses, a sticky card is all you really need. So they'll just sort of set them up at a, a foot or two above the plants and see what they catch. How about the second one, scouting? Uh, for damage crops, it's particularly useful when monitoring for pests that are blank. I'd have to say E. E? None of the above. None of the above? Yeah, well, A, two, no, you, uh, two is T-O, not T-O-O, -O, so I don't know what that means. Well, there's one right answer. <laughs> a, B, C, or D. Only one, not E. <laughs> right, so we'll just go ahead and we'll go to B. <laughs> Fair enough, on my grammatical error with twos, uh, fair enough, but uh, we are aiming for hard to detect or count is what we are aiming for. So generally with damage symptoms, uh, what you're looking for in this case are pests that are more or less virtually impossible to count. So things like uh, nematodes, uh, nematodes, plant pathogens, uh, those sorts of ideas that if you have sort of an idea of the amount of damage that correlates with the uh, sort of the yield loss or the number of pests that are typically associated, we'll just scout for that damage instead of trying to count the actual pests. That's the basic idea. So overall, people did pretty well on that one. And where we left off last time, moving into the topic at hand, was this idea of um, sampling costs. And the whole idea here is that when we're sampling for something, we're trying to uh, basically collect a subset of the population in order to get an estimate of the total population size so we can make good decisions. Uh, however, there is a trade-off there, where that is that the more you sample, uh, the more accurate your estimate becomes, the more uh, correct, the easier it becomes to make a decision for treatment. On the flip side, the more you sample, the more expensive it is, because you have to pay for scouts, you have to pay for sampling materials, and it's uh, also time that you could be using in other fields. And so it's kind of like you don't want to oversample because it's going to cost you money. You don't want to undersample because you might make a mistake. And so we talked a bit about this idea of sampling efficiency, where it's essentially the ratio of the cost to the accuracy. And what we really want is an efficient strategy, one where we are sampling a large enough number of individuals that we can get an idea of what the population is without spending too much time or money so that it becomes economically uh, uh, unattainable or unsustainable. And then we talked about a couple of little tricks you can use to make your sampling more efficient, such as uh, uh, using traps in order to trigger monitoring, things like sequential sampling. So I've just got a few more of these uh, techniques that we can use, and then we'll move on into the economic side of this. So as far as another thing you can use to increase the efficiency, of your sampling is to use something called a visual injury scale. So a visual injury scale is uh, commonly used for those scenarios we talked about before where you have a pest that's very small or very difficult to detect such as a pathogen or a nematode and essentially what a researcher has done is they figured out uh, the amount of damage you see on a plant with known infestations of the pest. So for example if we are looking at uh, the roots for, say, root knot nematode, someone has gone, infested a bunch of plants at known rates of, of um, root knot nematode. They'll pull up the plant, look at the roots, and they'll say, oh, if you have this many knots, it correlates most closely to this concentration of root knot nematodes. And you can come up with sort of a, a nice scale to estimate uh, the population size from there. 
And so what's nice about this is if you have something like the roots or if you have a plant that shows sort of a greening or a yellowing symptoms according to some pathogen, you can send scouts out into the field with a little card where they can basically uh, hold the leaf up and rank it on a sort of gradient based on what picture it matches most closely. And they can send that back, and that's a nice way to get an estimate on the amount of damage that's going on out there. And because you remove the lab work for searching for pathogens or nematodes and the like, you save yourself time and effort. So a really common example of this is the nematodes I talked about. So uh, with the root knot nematode, what you would do is pull up a certain number of plants. You would take them back to the lab, or you just sit out there because the root knots can be relatively large. You just count the number of knots you find, and then you rank it on a scale of zero being very low, all the way up to seven being very high. And then you take the average score across all the roots, and if the score is higher than a 0.1, then they recommend next year when you replant, uh, at least in the case of cotton, to use a resistant cotton variety instead. So basic idea behind a visual injury scale, is that we're not directly observing the pests, but we're looking at what they've left behind. In addition to this, we could do what we did in the spurs, which is that you monitor multiple pest species all at the same time. So if we're using essentially the same technique for different pest species that show up in the same place, there's no sense in looking for them all separately over separate time periods. We can just go through and look for all the species at once. So again, with the spurs, we looked at the European fruit lucanium, the San Jose scale, and the brown and red mites all at the same time. So that was four pests for the price of one sampling, which is very convenient. Uh, obviously, this doesn't always work, because you may have pests that have vastly different life cycles. Maybe they utilize different parts of the plant. Maybe you have to use different sampling techniques. So you might just be unable to do this. But uh, in cases where they do line up nicely, uh, this could be a really great way to save time. All right, so those are the last of the efficiency savers. I just wanted to take a moment to cover uh, the ways that we collect samples in terms of sampling patterns. And that'll wrap up the sampling section, I believe. So sampling patterns are pretty simple. It's more or less just the path that you follow and the choice of the location where you collect the samples in a field, right? So it's kind of like, if I've got an entire orchard, which particular trees do I sample from in order to get the most representative sample of all? And uh, what we see is that commonly there are uh, several different techniques we can use, at least three of them that are common in IPM. And while they all have sort of different objectives and they're useful in different situations, the key factor is that they all need to be unbiased, or as unbiased as possible. We want to be collecting as random a sample as we possibly can. Because as soon as we start adding bias in how we sample, right, we're going to start shifting the precision of our system. We're going to be moving off of that target center, uh, which is the accurate population estimate. And we're going to start getting inaccurate estimates, either too high or too low. And it's going to start making things uh, difficult to control. So as far as the three major techniques that we have, the most common and the one that is uh, probably just you've used if you've ever gone out and sampled in a systematic way is the random sample. And so it's exactly what it sounds like. You go out into the field, you sort of walk around and you'll randomly collect samples here and there. You're either pulling up plants, doing sweeps, all of those ideas. And, uh, and so by doing so, you basically have a statistically equal chance of sampling any given location in a field at any given time. Excuse me. And so uh, there's a couple ways. Well, I, before I get at myself, uh, this sounds really simple. You go out, you just randomly grab stuff. However, as we talked about last week when we were here, uh, when we went out and sampled almonds, it's pretty easy the first time you count an almond with 500 mummies on it to sort of actively start avoiding those trees because you don't want to count 500 mummies every single time you find one. And on the flip side, sometimes it's easy for people who are out scouting to actually aim for plants that look like they have worse infestation because you're kind of trying to find pests. And so oftentimes it's a little difficult to be truly random. 
Uh, we have a lot of sort of innate biases that we might not be thinking of while we are sampling. So sometimes it's useful to have a plan in place when you go out to increase randomness. So there's a couple ways you can do this. One of which is you can come at this with a plan to do sort of a systematic sampling path. And by that I mean, essentially you come in and you have a plan for the path you're going to walk through the field. So say the first time you sample the first week, you go out and you walk this simple X pattern through the field. This guarantees you're sampling uh, the edges, you're sampling the middle of the field. The next time you come out, you walk this W, where you're walking up and down. This way, you're making sure you're hitting up different parts of the field on different sampling days. You're not missing big gaps on the sides regularly, maybe where there's going to be a buildup of pests. You're always mixing it up. Uh, alternatively, when you are out there sampling, you're walking your path. A uh, useful thing to do is to basically come up with a plan to uh, basically randomly select plants while you're walking. So let's say you're walking along, the first plant you grab is the one that's five steps down the row, the next one you collect will be three steps, the next one will be ten steps down the row. Just consistently coming up with random numbers for when you're going to grab things. Such as, uh, you can do this with a simple sort of random number sheet which could be convenient. You can just print off one of those, keep it in your bag, and when you go out, you'll say, I'm going to do row 27 this time, and you'll just have a whole row of random numbers for the number of steps you'll take. Uh, on the flip side, some people will just go out there with like a tennis ball, and they'll just sort of throw it, and they'll walk over to wherever the tennis ball landed and sample the plant that's closest to that. It's just sort of a ways to build in some randomness. Ah. And one more thing about randomness is just to keep in mind that because populations of pests tend to be clustered uh, and don't always sort of uh, stay in one part of the field, you'll oftentimes have different representations on edges versus the middle, that it's important when you do sample to always make sure you hit all the major parts of the field, the middle, the sides, the north, south, east, and western uh, blocks, uh, parts of the block as well. All right. Stratified sampling, this is the second one. So stratified sampling is really helpful when you have a universe that might have different sort of ecological conditions within one single sampling universe. Uh, so basically what you would do is you would take that habitat and then you would partition it into two separate subunits that you sample independently because they have different conditions in them. So in this example we have a field where Approximately two-thirds of the field here in white, stratum A, is a loamy soil, whereas stratum B is a sandy soil. So we may expect to find different profiles of soil-based pests. And so what they would recommend is that if you're scouting for those soil-based pests, those pathogens, those nematodes, whatever, you treat these two as separate blocks or separate universes. And you sample them separately and run all of your analyses on those separately. So again, this is most handy in universes where you have very diverse uh, habitats within them. And one thing to keep in mind is that even if a field looks like it's universal, oftentimes it's helpful to treat the edges separately from the middle of the field, to treat those as separate universes. Just because pests tend to accumulate on the edge, as that is where they uh, come into the field when they migrate, or if you have things like mites that are associated with dust, they'll just sort of get blown in naturally from the roads on the edge. All right. And then finally, you have systematic sampling. And systematic sampling is also fairly straightforward. Essentially, what you're doing is you're just sampling uh, from sort of a random starting point, and you're just sampling every certain number of units. So if you're like, say, uh, sort of riding your tractor, you know, up and down the field, you know, doing some sort of tilling or spraying or something. Like every time you would turn, you would just sort of reach over and take a soil sample or something, right? It's, you're collecting every 50th plant, every turn, every whatever. And this is really handy if you're trying to sample a large number of fields that are very homogenous, uh, all have the same crop, all have the same pest that you're looking for, and you're just looking to collect a large number of samples relatively quickly. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with systematic sampling. It's uh, not particularly random, but if you do it correctly, you will hit every single part of the field, uh, you know, when you go through. Uh, 
All right, and the last thing on sampling is just to point this out again. As we covered in economic entomology, there is a difference between what's absolute sampling and relative sampling. So in absolute sampling, this is a technique where we basically can put a definite number of pests in a certain area of space. So this would be like, if we're trying to measure weeds, we could go out with a little uh, quadrat, a square made out of PVC pipe, lay it down, and we could count the number of weeds uh, within like a one square yard quadrat. And then we could go in and say, there are this many weeds per square yard, that means it's this many per acre, or this many per field. You get a really nice definite number of pests. Similarly, you could say count the number of aphids per plant, so you could get a nice estimate of the total number of aphids in the entire field. Now, this gives you a really accurate measure, but it's also really time intensive, and it's way more detailed than we need when we're making a decision. So in IPM, we tend to lean towards using relative sampling instead. Relative sampling is just a technique that provides an estimate of the abundance, uh, but it doesn't give you exact numbers in time and space. So we won't get, say, the number of aphids per, per plant, but what we would get an estimate of is the number of aphids we got per sweep in an alfalfa field, right? What's handy for this is that though we won't know the exact number of aphids there are, we will know how many there are relative to our other sweeps. So if we go out on week one and sweep and we get seven aphids per sweep, we come out three weeks later and we get uh, 20 aphids per sweep, we know that the aphid population is going up. We don't necessarily know how many aphids there are per plant, but we know we're on an increasing trend. And so uh, the important thing to keep in mind about relative sampling is that because it's all relative, it's all based on the sweep, it's all based on the sticky card, what's in the trap, it's important that every time you do that relative measure, you do it exactly the same way you did it before. And so, you know, you can't go out there and be sweeping with different levels of vigor. You can't take different numbers of sweeps. You need to always be the same. And this matters less when you're doing the work and more when you've got a scout doing it. Because if you have different scouts, if you have a large number of scouts, all in different locations, and they're all helping each other, then you might get very different counts between individuals. And that can skew a lot of your results. And as I mentioned before, you've all taken economic entomology, and many of you have had the other plant health courses that are offered here, or you've taken them in community colleges, or in ag classes in high schools, and you've probably heard of most of the sampling techniques, and I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time talking about those here. Those are, uh, can be learned elsewhere or on the job, so we're going to skip over that. We're going to get into more of the theory of uh, monitoring and when to treat. So how do we decide that it's time to treat? We've done all this monitoring. We have a basic estimate of the populations, or at least we have a basic estimate of whether populations are increasing or decreasing. So when do we actually go out and treat for a pest? When is the pest a problem as opposed to just something we have to live with? And this is really sort of up for debate. Some people are more inclined towards you should spray as soon as you see the pest. You don't want to deal with it. Some people are a little bit more live and let live. As long as I'm making money, I'm fine. Uh, Stern et al. were really the first ones who sort of sent us down the path that IPM takes, which is that we should treat whenever we are at what they call economic damage. So economic damage just being <laughs> a rather irritatingly vague definition of the amount of damage that justifies the cost of control. So that leaves a little bit of room for interpretation. And when this first came out, people didn't feel like it was a super great answer. And, uh, but it has a certain charm to it. The idea here, though, is that essentially you're not spending more money than you need to to control the pest. And you're also not treating so late that you're losing money because the pest got away from you. And this is helping you avoid all sorts of uh, economic blunders, such as uh, spending more to treat a pest than the damage it would cause, which would be the case of spraying a pest as soon as you find it, uh, or applying control after significant damage has occurred. We're basically sitting at a place where we're going to reduce spraying as much as we can 
save money and protect the environment, while also spraying just enough to protect the crop that's out there. So what following IPM scientists did after this was they did some thinking on economic damage and they said, well, how can we actually quantify economic damage in a way that's useful to growers? And what they came up with was the economic injury level, or the EIL. Mm, excuse me. And the economic injury level is in many ways sort of the crooks of IPM. It is right at the heart of the entire field. Uh, it's in some ways the simplest form of IPM, the idea that you don't spray unless you have an economic reason. Uh, and then in other ways it really informs how we go about IPM. Because much of IPM is trying to set up field conditions so that we never hit that economic injury level in the first place. So what the economic injury level then is it's the minimum number of pests where the cost of damage to the crop equals the cost of treatment, right? So one thing to notice here is that we're not talking about damage. We're actually talking about the number of pests. So an economic injury level is a certain number of insects, nematodes, or pathogens in a system. Right. So like I was saying, economic injury level is a measure of the number of pests. And so it's really a question of going out there and measuring how many pests are in a system, whether it's per sweeps, per plant, uh, those sorts of ideas. And ultimately, it's the idea of how much damage these pests will cost and whether that equals the cost of treatment. So another way to look at it is the economic injury level is really the point, uh, the number of pests where if the pests are below that point, you're spending more money to control the pest population than the amount of damage they would ultimately have caused. Where on the flip side, if they are above that point, we would lose more in revenue uh, excuse me, than we could have um, otherwise from just treating them earlier. So really it's the break-even point. Treating under is spending more money than the damage it would cause. Treating above is spending money after the damage has already been done. So we're losing money on top of revenue loss from the yield. And as I mentioned, this is just a very popular tool in IPM. It's widespread. Uh, you'll oftentimes find when you're in systems where there aren't any other IPM resources, such as systems where biocontrol hasn't been looked at, there will be economic injury levels. So how do you know, when you're not certain what the market's going to look like, what these levels are going to be? Ah. Sure not, like average market prices over a few years or what not? Yeah, so that's tricky, right? That um, economic injury level is ultimately a function of how much it costs to treat, how much you're expecting to get in revenue out of your crop, right? As well as the amount of damage. And so there's a lot of flexibility in the economic injury level. And so we're going to go into more detail on that in uh, just about two or three slides. So uh, let's go through that. And if you still have questions, uh, let me know when we get through there. So... In addition to the economic injury level, uh, we have the economic threshold. So economic injury level is generally a useful sort of theoretical point. We don't want to go above it. We don't want to go too far below it. We want to treat right around the economic injury level. But from a practical viewpoint, it's a little bit tricky. Because in reality, by the time the pest has already hit the economic injury level, uh, it's more or less impossible to go out there and treat it immediately so you hit that economic injury level directly. Chances are by the time you line up a sprayer, by the time you get a written recommendation, everything in line, you purchase your chemical, you're already going to have passed that economic injury level. You're going to be uh, substantially higher. And so what we use in IPM instead uh, as sort of our trigger for treating is the economic threshold. So economic threshold then would be the Minimum number of pests that should trigger management. So whereas the EIL is the break-even point, this is the point at which you would actually go out and treat the pest that you found. So generally, economic thresholds are designed to be a count of pests that's just a little bit below the economic injury level, so that you have a couple days or maybe a week of time to uh, basically prep your control treatment before the pest population is going to get up to that economic injury level. It's just built to basically account for the fact that the population is going to keep increasing. And again, economic thresholds are really common. 
And what you're going to find is that the economic thresholds are going to vary pretty significantly between pests, but also between crops, depending on how the particular pest gets at the crop. So for example, this is the uh, southern root knot nematode, um, economic thresholds per 25 cubic centimeters of soil. And as you can see that these economic thresholds can vary quite considerably. On the high end, cowpea is fairly resistant. You can have up to 52 nematodes per 25 cubic centimeters, whereas some of the root crops, such as carrots uh, or sweet potatoes, are down at the zero point, which kind of makes sense. If you've got a pest that directly attacks roots, you're going to be most concerned if the part of the plant you're harvesting is the roots. And so you're going to uh, be much more willing to forgive nematodes in something where you harvest the part above ground than the part below. Although potatoes seem to be doing okay. They're maybe a little bit more tolerant. All right, but just so to visualize it, this is our standard population growth graph that we've been talking about a lot in the ecology section, right? We have the population size of the pest. We have time. We expect pest populations here in red to grow sort of uh, logistically until they hit the carrying capacity. If the economic injury level is right here, the, if the pest is above here, we're starting to lose significant amounts of yield. If we're down here, we're losing some, but not enough to uh, justify the cost of the spray. And ideally, what you have is a nice economic threshold set just below the economic injury level. So if we hit here, take a day or two to actually apply the treatment, we knock down the population before it gets to the EIL uh, so that we don't actually exceed that point. Sort of with the goal of getting close to EIL as we can so we get the biggest bang for our buck. So, as Greg mentioned, EIL can be rather complicated because there's a lot of factors that come into it. When we talk about money, we suddenly take things out of the realm of sort of simple biological systems and we start adding economics to it. And whereas a root knot nematode may cause about the same amount of damage in carrots year after year, the value of carrots may change. Similarly, uh, the, uh, the value or the cost of the control treatment may change. And as such, determining where that EIL goes can uh, be relatively complicated. Uh, from a year-to-year -year or even from a sort of day-to-day -day basis in some crops. So the general equation that we can use to think of EIL is this nice one right here, where the EIL, economic injury level, is equal to the cost of the pest management divided by the market value of the crop multiplied by the degree of injury per pest and the susceptibility of the crop to damage. Right. And as you can tell, virtually none of these can be controlled by the grower. More or less, uh, this leaves a lot of the decision making up to the whims of the market, as well as to the particular biology of the pest and the crop. So let's talk about the cost of treatment. Let's break down these parts individually. The so cost of treatment is exactly what it sounds like. It is how much it costs to treat the particular pest. So how much it costs, say, per acre to spray, how much it costs you to hire somebody to go out and handpick weeds in some cases, uh, just those sorts of ideas. And those prices can fluctuate a little bit. So given this equation, if the cost of control goes up, which direction do we expect the economic injury level to go? Do we expect it to go up or down? Or down. Right. So... Well, hold on. <laughs> no, it'd go up. Yeah. You're yeah. sacrificing a crop for the cost. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So it'll actually go up. Right? So as the cost of the treatment goes up, the economic injury level goes up. Remember, the economic injury level is the number of pests that we're willing to tolerate on the plant. So essentially, uh, as C increases, the benefit of that control decreases. If all of a sudden we have to go from paying 10 bucks an acre to treat a pest to going to $20 an acre, uh, excuse me, by treating early before we hit that economic sort of threshold, we're losing more money because we're spending twice as much per acre to do that treatment.
So yeah, I have an example here. So let's say you have, say, 100 acres of tomato, and a pesticide application costs $10 per acre, right? So to treat the entire field, you're spending $1,000 to do basic insect control. So the economic injury level would be the number of pests that would cause you that $1,000 worth of damage, right? On the flip side, if insecticide doubles and all of a sudden you're paying $20 per acre, the amount of money you have to pay to spray the field off also doubles. You're now at $2,000. Now, if the value of the tomato stays the same and the biology of the pest stays the same, then essentially you just have to withstand twice as much damage before you hit that break-even point, right? Because stink bugs are still going to damage tomatoes at the same rate they were back when pesticides were only, were only $10 an acre. So you need basically twice as many stink bugs to cause that 2,000 just as you did before. Oops, wrong button. On the flip side though, we don't usually see this as a major factor in economic injury level. Management costs tend to be stable. Uh, oftentimes, you might find some form of control that's cheaper, but oftentimes labor costs or uh, equipment costs will sort of even that out. <coughs> same thing, uh, same thing with uh, when things become more expensive. Typically, companies will invest time to find a cheaper solution in order to gain more market share. So you tend to see that these prices sort of stay the same and just grow with inflation. So cost isn't usually the biggest factor in determining the economic injury level, unless you have big resistance problems and you have to move to more expensive chemistries. Okay, market value. So market value is the value of the crop uh, when you take it out to sale, essentially, right? So we're not talking about the value of the control, that's C, we're talking about the value of what you're actually trying to sell. So that's uh, right there on the bottom, V. And so we do see, though, that market value can fluctuate pretty widely in a short period of time. Uh, back in 2008, the price of rice doubled in about seven months uh, because they had some serious grower issues in Southeast Asia. And so all of a sudden, rice was, sub rice was substantially more valuable than it was, uh, a little bit closer to home. Almond prices have been dropping uh, pretty significantly for a while now. And so, you know, that really affects how we decide to protect the crop. So on the flip side, if we saw the value change, let's say the value of the crop went down, how would we expect that? Or actually, let's be consistent. Last time we said the cost went up, let's say the value goes up. Let's say you're growing almonds and all of a sudden the price picks back up and we jump up 50% instead of decreasing that. How is that going to change the economic injury level? The lower. Right going to lower it. So as the crop value increases, the economic injury level decreases. So to go back to our tomato example, just to sort of walk through this. If each tomato is basically worth about 15 cents and it costs $10 per acre to treat, then to justify the cost at that $10 rate, you have to lose about 70 tomatoes per acre to justify the cost. That's your break-even point. You lose 70 tomatoes, you end up uh, breaking even for the amount of money you spent to spray. On the flip side, if your tomatoes increase in value, now they're worth 20 cents each, which I understand is not how we price tomatoes, but it's just easy for an example. So if we have, say, uh, a little bit of an increase there, 33% jump, we're at 20 cents a tomato, all of a sudden you're losing 50 per acre to justify a spray because each tomato is worth a little bit more. So to get to that $10 per acre cost, you have to lose less tomatoes. So your economic injury level gets pushed down. So this is why oftentimes in high value crops, we see a lot more sprays. So like, um, I don't have the hard numbers, but talking to a lot of guys uh, out there, some PCAs and some extension guys, they were saying that when almonds were sort of at their peak price, people were spraying a lot uh, to control various pests because the crop was so valuable that they were essentially making up all of those extra sprays and how much more they were making off of their harvests. So uh, one thing to keep in mind though is that the market value uh, may be reflective of the product quality as well. So in certain crops, 
where you can get downgraded at the packing house, right? Such as citrus, right? So in citrus, there's the fresh fruit market, which is very valuable, and you've got the juice market, which is substantially marked down. Sometimes economic injury levels can be substantially hot, substantially lower, excuse me, in that fresh market because they don't want to run the chance of getting downgraded to that juicing market where they're going to lose a whole bunch of money there. So you might be dealing with very similar crops, two very similar oranges, but because of the path they're destined to go down, they're going to have very different economic injury levels. All right, so I. I stands for the degree of injury per pest. So essentially what this is, is just the different amount of, uh, the certain amount of injury that you expect from every single pest that lands on the plant. And this is really just reflective of the fact that different pests cause different types of damage. So when you're working with something like weeds, weeds are light stealers, they compete for water, they cause lots of indirect damage. And so weeds can stunt your plants and generally be a nuisance, but they're not you're not typically going to see like a huge loss of crop from having some slight weed problems. On the flip side, you have things like insects that consume tissues, fruits, assimilates, and pathogens that generally uh, reduce photosynthesis or can completely wipe out plants depending on what they are. And so depending on the type of, oh, there we go, I gave away that answer. I thought I had another pin here. But so depending on the severity of the damage you see, you're going to shift your economic injury level up and down. So essentially, as the degree of pest injury goes up, the economic injury level goes down. And just as a reminder, when I talk about economic injury level going up and down, I'm just talking about the number of pests in the system that justify the control. So when I say that it's going up, that means that there have to be, say, more insects on a plant, uh, say that you have to have 20 when you go up, whereas if the economic injury level goes down, it means you only need to have 10 insects per plant to actually justify the spray. So again, we're just talking about raw numbers of pests that are on a plant or in a system uh, whenever we're talking about injury levels going up and down. What about, like, how do you justify that for a pathogen? For a pathogen? Yeah. Yeah, so pathogens are where it gets tricky. So admittedly, economic injury level is a tool that works really well in insects, it works relatively well in nematodes, but it doesn't work really well in things that you can't see and count, like pathogens, or, uh, yeah, well, pathogens in general, whether they're viruses, bacteria, or fungi, because it's hard to estimate how many of them there are. And so that's kind of just a fundamental challenge in IPM, which is that the way we look at insects and the way we look at pathogens are vastly different from one another. With insects, we can physically see them, we can count their populations, and so it's relatively easy with insects to say, you know what, it's okay to have, say, five you know, grasshoppers per square meter. Let's just try and keep them there. But with pathogens, they can sneak up on you, and your field looks fine one day, and then a week later, you know, it's like a flip was switched. A switch was flipped. And, <laughs> excuse me. A flip was switched, and you know you're suddenly looking at a really depleted field, and so um, and so. Oftentimes, what you'll see is that when you're dealing with pathogens, you don't have a whole lot of economic injury level talk. What you see a lot of is preventative stuff, preventative sprays, sanitation, work to try and prevent the pathogen from ever getting in the system. Uh, and alternatively, sometimes what you see is when you're dealing with economic injury levels. In plants with pathogens, you're looking at, say, the number of damaged plants per acre, and then it's just a question of how you're going to treat them after the season's over, whether you're going to replant with resistant plants or whether you're going to have to uh, spray a fungicide after you harvest. And so the way we get at pathogens is really different from how we get at insects and uh, nematodes. And hopefully that's something we'll have some time towards the end of the semester to really dig into, because it's a... Uh, I have a really interesting aspect of this. But so anyway, the whole idea of this, uh, what was it talking about? Degree of injury. The idea behind this degree of injury is just that if the pest causes much more severe damage, just sort of naturally and obviously, we're not going to tolerate as much of that pest in the system. So an example to stick with the tomatoes again, beet armyworms shows up in tomatoes, 
It feeds on the leaves. You're going to lose some photosynthetic ability. You're going to have to deal with a little bit of frass. Every once in a while, they'll chew the top of the tomato and leave a little scar. But it's not a big deal. Whereas tomato fruitworm likes to burrow into the young fruits. They leave a big sort of mushy hole that gets infected with fungi. You uh, lose the entire tomato. So naturally, we can tolerate a lot more beet armyworm in the field than we can tomato fruitworms. We don't really want much of any of them flying around if we can avoid it. So the uh, EIL, oh, jeez, <laughs> stupid. This is the challenge with high versus low, right? So with a beet armyworm, we would have a higher EIL. We could tolerate way more beet armyworms in this system. Whereas with a tomato fruitworm, we have a low economic injury level. We don't want to tolerate very many of them at all. And so just fundamentally from that, certain types of damage are way worse than others. Generally, anything that attacks the fruit or completely kills the plant is the worst, sort of like a tomato fruitworm or a um, uh, like Wang Long Bing and citrus. Those sorts of things are the very worst. worst. And then you have things like light stealers, tissue consumers that are bad, but can be tolerated at much higher levels um, than the uh, particular uh, sort of direct damage uh, type pests are. And then finally, we have D, or the crop susceptibility to damage. And this is kind of the flip side of the injury type. It's the idea that just like different uh, pests cause different types of injury, different life stages in a crop are more or less susceptible to damage than others. So typically what we see, right, is that when a plant is developing, the developing tissue is the most susceptible to damage. Uh, and as such, the most susceptible crops are typically those that are very young. So the seedlings, uh, the transplants, but also the parts of the plant that are developing the fruit. If you damage those, you're going to see a lot more economic loss down the road than you would, say, from feeding on older tissue that's already well established. And so sometimes economic injury levels can shift depending on the particular life stage the plant is in. So uh, with D, again, we're talking about a, uh, a factor that's on the denominator, just like B and I. So if D were to increase, if we were worried about damage on a particular part of the plant that was highly susceptible, where do we think the economic injury level would go? Right, down. Same idea as the others. That the more susceptible the crop is, the less pests we're willing to tolerate on it. Which again, makes sort of a gut intuitive sense. If we have, if we have a whole bunch of blooms out in the orchards right now, and if you lose those blooms, you're going to fail to uh, pollinate, you're going to lose your almonds, you want to make sure you're protecting those blooms as much as you can. And so we're not going to tolerate very much in ways of uh, fungal or in insect problems. Of course, that's kind of a bad example because you just sort of do bloom sprays no matter what. But it's the basic idea. That's a very susceptible life stage. Oh, leave that there for just a second. All right, and so susceptibility to damage has a little bit more to it. Um, uh, so, sorts of this damage can basically also be not just associated with a particular growth stage. It may depend on the part of the plant that gets fed on. So this kind of links up to that injury that I talked about earlier, whether we're talking about direct damage or damage to the part of the um, organ of the plant that we actually harvest and counts directly towards our yield versus indirect damage that attacks any part of the plant but the part that we actually harvest. Uh, the intensity of the injury, so how injuries compound over time. There are certain pests where if you have a low number of infestation, they cause a low amount of damage, but as they accumulate in numbers, we don't see sort of a linear increase in damage, we see an exponential curve. That uh, sort of like you have low damage, low damage, low damage until you hit a certain threshold, and then suddenly there's high damage. So in that case, initial feeding may be not a problem, but if we've had the pests for a while, we need to start worrying about them. And then finally, these environmental variables. 
the idea that certain environmental variables may uh, synergize in order to make the damage much worse than it would be otherwise. Sort of the idea that um, something they've shown in a lot of naturally resistant plants is that their resistance tends to be decreased at very high temperatures. So that if you have systems where you have, say, a fungal resistant uh, wheat variety, it may be perfectly fine until you start getting temperatures around 100 degrees. And then all of a sudden that resistance breaks down and the fungi can show up. Not such a huge problem in the Central Valley where it's pretty dry whenever you have those high temperatures. Maybe a bigger problem if you're dealing with something in the Midwest where you have uh, summer showers pretty regularly. And you might be dealing with high temperature, high moisture systems uh, semi-regularly. So finally, this is the cheat sheet. So essentially, if cost goes up, economic injury level goes up. Cost and economic injury level are directly related, so they always move in the same uh, direction. Whereas on the other hand, V, I, and D are all inversely related to economic injury level. So if they go up, then the economic injury level goes down. If we see a increase in the type of damage, in the degree of the damage, in the value of the crop, then economic injury level is going to be low. We're not going to tolerate nearly as much um, damage as before. So let me pull that back up while we're here. Clearly that's uh, all I have, so you are free to go. Uh, as you can see though, all of these things are kind of up in the air. We've got a mix of things that are clearly economic, like the value of the crop and the cost, whereas we also have in this equation things that are just strictly biological, like the degree of injury, uh, the damaging stage, the uh, developmental stage of the plant. So it's kind of like, this is not necessarily an equation that we can take a whole bunch of numbers, plug them into, and get a nice, hard, and fast number for EIL. More so, this is a theoretical construct to help us understand how economic injury levels move around in response. So if you're out there trying to make a decision, unfortunately, I don't have a tool for you that's going to basically clearly say, this is your economic injury level. Uh, oftentimes, to find the economic injury level, you need a fairly rigorous uh, economic study where someone will expose a crop to a variety of infestation levels. They'll count the amount of yield loss, and then they'll estimate the value of the crop and the value of control at that particular time. So oftentimes, as a PCA, you're going to have to kind of make it up a little bit. And that's going to depend partially on the grower you're working with, it's going to depend on where you think the market is going to go. If you've got a grower who likes to play it safe, doesn't want to mess around, maybe you want to go a little bit lower than the recommended economic injury level. If uh, the UC system says you want to treat when there are five San Jose scales on the spur, maybe you want to treat when there's four. You just want to play it safe. On the flip side, if you've got a grower who's a little bit more, uh, who's not so risk adverse, is willing to take that risk, and isn't going to necessarily be too upset if you go a little high, then you might be willing to push it up. Maybe they want to save as much money as possible before their harvest. So it's going to really depend. And that's something we'll touch on later in the course, which is just the idea that a lot of this stuff is going to be your best judgment. So we'll touch on that later. Uh, have a nice three-day weekend.